Good evening. Welcome to Spring Harvest Home. I am live and so are you in your lounge. It's good to see you. I'm Abby and I am here with just one technician, Sim, the brave Sim, taking on all the techie duties this evening. And uh, Cheryl, our speech to text captioner, is typing away in Wales. And, uh, and you're all here too. Thanks for all your messages and your chat. It's great to be joined by so many people from so many places. I've really enjoyed reading um, all the chat and all the banter that's going on. Apparently we have lots of cats and dogs joining us this evening too. You are also very welcome to Spring Harvest Home. I just need to point out that if you see any films or videos or any content this evening where there appear to be too many people in one place, it's because they share a house and they're allowed to be in the same video. I've been asked to say that because people are going, hang on a minute, what about the distancing rules? We have observed all of them and as far as I'm aware we haven't broken any in the making of Spring Harvest Home. What else do I need to say? Thank you for all of you sharing your pictures. We love all the tents that have been set up in gardens and in lounges and particularly the tea towels on the heads from Big Start this morning. We love your costumes and don't forget to video yourselves singing along to Glow. We want to see all the videos you can so that we can cut them together for a big bonanza at the end of the week. That'll be really good fun together. If you need the subtitles, don't forget that they are there. You can click the button to turn them on for the whole session. And if you need BSL, British Sign Language, it's slightly different. It's only available for the talk itself. And when the talk comes from Amy later, you just need to switch playlists, watch it in the BSL playlist, and then switch back to join us here. And the BSL for this evening is available, which is great news. Thank you to Signs of God and all of our wonderful signers who have helped us out this week. The things I need to tell you about this evening, or I'd like to tell you about, in fact, um, you've been listening to some music while you've been waiting. New Songs for the Church came out this year and it also came with the songbook. If you are a worship leader or a worshipper or just like to play the piano by yourself when no one's listening, like I do, then uh, this songbook is for you. It comes with a digital songbook too when you buy it so you can use it on all your devices. Um, great new songs, 60 songs in the book and uh, 11, 13 on the CD, including Glow, the Big Start theme song, which is great. So we've been listening to that and enjoying it. Also, We've heard you talking about mugs. Yes, there are Spring Harvest mugs this year, but they're a limited edition, there aren't many. So there is this one, the Unleashed mug. Bring it a little bit closer for you there. Doesn't really work, apparently. And uh, there is also this one, a collapsible mug. Look at this, hang on, get it to work. There, now you can really feel like you're at Spring Harvest when you're drinking out of this and it's got Unleashed on it too. Those are now in springharvest.shop. They, um, they cost a little bit more than they would have done on site just because of all the extra transport that we've had to do and to get it to you. But those are available, which is pretty fun, we think. And uh, there is also going to be, just going to let you in on a little secret, a live album this year. Now, it won't be the worship we've been enjoying in the evenings, but it will be previously unreleased live worship from Spring Harvest. And there's going to be uh, a whole CD's worth, but it'll be digital only. And you'll be able to download that from the end of the week. And I'll tell you more about it soon. Great. The next thing for me to do is to introduce to you our event partner. We have been thrilled and delighted to work with Mercy Ships over the last few years. And if you've been to Spring Harvest in the last couple of years, you'll have heard about Mercy Ships and you will also know how brilliant they are. And so I'm really pleased to be able to say we have got another message from Mercy Ships this year and you can see more of their work coming up now. Two out of three people in the world don't have access to safe, affordable and timely surgery, many of whom are in pain or who've been going through really debilitating illnesses. Mercy Ships follows a 2,000 year old model of Jesus, bringing hope and healing to the world's forgotten poor. What happens here on this ship is so life changing to the people who come here to receive care. Attendez 
ça a commencé à grandir. Si je n'avais pas mis ce chiffre, moi j'avais désespéré parce que je n'avais pas de moyens. Et j'étais conscient que arriver à mettre ce chiffre, tout va se passer bien. La première fois, parce que j'avais regardé mon visage quand on m'a opéré hier. Parce que j'avais encore la bande bombe, bombe comme ça, je me disais que peut-être que mal. Mais quand on a enlevé la bande, premier pensement, j'ai dit que oui, me voici, est-ce que c'est vraiment réel? <rire> quand je suis venu, donc les gens ne m'ont plus reconnu. C'est tout le monde qui venait m'embrasser. Well, there's five billion unmet surgeries. So to think that we can be part of reducing that number, even in the smallest amount, to be able to bring that expertise here and to be part of the team. That seems like a pretty wonderful way to spend my days and spend my time. When I initially volunteered, I was thinking I was going to be a doctor on the ship. But as God would have it, Another role came up about being a speaker. I never would have been exposed to that option had I not taken the initial step. And that's what I would encourage other people to do. People may think, oh, you can only be either a doctor or, or a nurse to do that. Um, and that's just not the case. In fact, we need people to help run the ship and keep it going. So cleaners, cooks, anything you can think of that needs to run your house or run your job, all of those roles are needed on the ship too. That's the backbone of it. The best thing about working on the ship is that I'm working with people who have a really positive attitude. Here, it's always, let me see what I can do. It might take some time, but we're going to figure it out and we'll figure it out together. So that's life-changing and it's life-giving. If you're working in an environment where there's optimism and there's hope, and it's not just you know, for your patients, but it's actually everyone around you is striving for something that's better, not just for your patients, but for each other as well, that's something that's priceless. I cannot thank God enough for the crew members because it cost them a great sacrifice of love to raise their funds to come and work on the ship at their own expense. That's what we call practical love. We went to Spring Harvest. I met um, somebody from Mercy Ships and they said to me, what did you do as a job? And I said, well, I was a baker, nothing more or less than that. I could see a nurse, I could see a doctor, I could see a dentist in those roles. But as a baker, I felt, doesn't everybody know how to bake? And he said to me, we need bakers. That just broke me. That just turned me around. And I said, yeah, I'll go. And I realized at that point that God was moving me all these years of my life to the age of 70 to go on the African Mercy. You have a role to play. Whatever your skills have been, God can do things through it and with it. I've never seen love like this shown people. You cannot afford not to be part of this. So friends, let me appeal to you. You have three alternatives and you can do all three. You can give, you can pray, you can volunteer, or you know someone who can volunteer too. Whatever you do, love.
we are in the middle of a global pandemic. Never before have we realized the value of the NHS and those that serve within it. They are literally saving the lives of individuals every single day. We stand on the precipice of this pandemic moving into Africa, where the NHS doesn't exist, where those frontline workers uh, aren't there, where lives will be shattered. And so Spring Harvest, I ask you, will you stand with us at Mercy Ships to respond to that crisis? Will you give, will you go, and will you pray? Will you right now go to mercyships.org.uk and make a financial gift to support us in what we're doing to save lives like Valley and Edith? Will you sign up to go and serve in Africa wherever the crisis takes us? And will you stand with us in prayer, knowing that the prayers of the many will transform the lives of even more? Thank you. So why don't we pray together now? It seems to be the best response, doesn't it, to what we've seen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work of Mercy Ships. Thank you for the many, many thousands that are serving you around the world with medical and surgical help. And we pray your blessing upon them now. Why don't you add your own prayers for Mercy Ships and for the work that they do. And Lord, as we've been reminded, the, the world is full of those who can't access medical help. And especially at this time, that feels so devastating. And so we pray for all those who are struggling to get the help that they need, for all those countries where this pandemic is going to hit harder than we can imagine. We pray for them. Please add your own prayers too. And Lord, more widely in our current context, the, the big picture of, of the world, you see it all and you know, you feel our pain and you hear our cries. And we cry out to you now for all those who are suffering, for all those who are grieving, for all those who are fearful, and for those carers on the front line especially. for places where the virus is having an impact on access to food, for Tunisia and other countries around the world where lockdown is having a really detrimental effect. Please, Lord, would your hand be at work? Would your comfort and your presence be known? And Lord, we pray that the worldwide church would be present, that our voice would be heard in prayers and in offers of help, and in support. Show us what we can do and not least inspire us to pray. <clears throat> we thank you that you hear all our prayers and we believe that you respond. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Well, if you want to keep praying, please do. And we're going to worship together because we believe that our God is God. He is Lord of all, whatever happens. And we continue to worship him in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. So we continue to pray and we worship too. And I'm gonna hand now to Lucy to lead us in worship. Well, hi everyone. We're going to start with a time of worship. Wherever you are um, at home, whoever you're with, it's time to just turn our attention to God and to give him the praise that is due his name. So we're going to start.
a song that just lifts up the name of Jesus. Let's sing, let our praise. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign that we are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. Cause we are here for you. We are here for you. I sing to you our hearts are open. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down. Let our shout be your anthem, let our shout be your anthem, your renown, fill the skies, cause we are here for
Yes, Lord, you are great and we worship you with every breath that we are able. Amen. Amen. Well, this evening we continue our journey through Acts. We're still in chapter two. It's a big chapter and uh, we're going to be hearing a little bit more about what happens after the Holy Spirit is poured out. So we're carrying on this evening from uh, verse 14. When Peter stood with the other 11 apostles, he raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk as you suspect. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. 
Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And he goes on to quote the prophet Joel. And we heard Bishop Jill speak about some of those prophecies last night. He carries on and then he quotes David as well. Lots of scripture quoting going on here from Peter. He says, brothers and sisters, from verse 29, I can speak confidently about the patriarch David. He died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this very day. Because he was a prophet, he knew that God promised him with a solemn pledge to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Having seen this beforehand, David spoke about the resurrection of Christ. And he goes on to quote David again. Peter carries on, it's quite a sermon. He carries on and carries on and says, Therefore, verse 36, let all Israel know beyond question that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the crowd heard this, they were deeply troubled and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, change your hearts and lives. Each of you must be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you. It's for your children. It's for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God invites. And with many other words, he testified to them and encouraged them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And those who accepted Peter's message were baptized and God brought about 3000 people into the community that day. Well, to unpack a little bit of this passage and Peter's epic sermon, I'm gonna hand over to Amy or Ewing. Amy, it's over to you. Hi, my name's Amy or Ewing. I'm the Senior Vice President of RZIM and the Director of the OCA, the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. And it's a real privilege to be with you at Spring Harvest online tonight. And we're going to be looking at the book of Acts and chapter 2 from verses 22 to 41. And um, the, the title is Peter Unleashed. What does it look like after Pentecost for, for um, Peter to give this amazing speech, which then kind of turns the known world up upside down and I guess kicks the whole church globally off. So tonight, the passage we're looking at is a speech and I wonder how you are coping with communication right now in lockdown. Um, I, like probably many others, am only able to communicate with my parents who are in that um, above 70 age brackets online. And so we've been on FaceTime. We've had quite a lot of hilarious conversations where all I can see, 80% of the screen is the ceiling. 20% uh, is half of one of their faces, uh, just trying to actually get the technology to work so that we can see one another and communicate with one another. We're all coping with changes for some of us in our jobs. That's going to mean working from home, perhaps coping with homeschooling children. That's the situation that I'm in. Maybe for others, there's been a loss of job and loss of loved ones as well. And so this very worrying, frightening time is actually biting us very personally, financially and um, in our family lives. And so I think if we're real about that, about how hard the situation we find ourselves in today actually is, we might think, what does a speech and a speech from the ancient world given, you know, over 2000 years ago, what does that have to do with our situation? And I have to confess, as I've been preparing, I've been asking that question, God, what do you want to say to us through this speech? right now, today, to your people and to us at Spring Harvest. And I believe that God wants to speak to us about how we respond to uncertainty and fear for the future with resurrection hope and with the Spirit's fire. When you think about it like that, that does feel a bit more relevant, doesn't it? God wants to um, encourage us and inspire us in all the different challenging circumstances we're facing to respond to that uncertainty and fear with the resurrection hope that is our legacy as followers of Jesus and with the Spirit's fire that only he can give. 
So just a little bit of introduction. In the book of Acts, um, there are more speeches recorded in this book than in any other historical book of the time. Um, there are historians like Thucydides and Herodotus, and they do record speeches, but Luke makes a particular point of recording a lot of, uh, a lot of speeches. In, in fact, Acts records eight speeches by Peter, two speeches by James, one speech by Stephen, and nine speeches by Paul. And then he also includes four other long speeches that involve other people interacting with Christianity. So we have Gamaliel, a prominent Jewish scholar. We have um, the town clerk of Ephesus. We have King Agrippa and a Roman uh, procurator called Festus. And their interaction with, with the Christian faith uh, is recorded as four speeches. And so if you think about the purpose of the book of Acts as, if you like, recording the process by which the message of Jesus and the Gospels advances beyond those 12 disciples and the other group of disciples kind of around them in Galilee, and it advances throughout the whole world, this massive and powerful growth of the church, and Acts is, is trying to somehow capture how that happened it's fascinating that Luke focuses so much on speeches. The process of going from 12 to 120, from 120 to 3,120, and then from that 3,120 through the book of Acts to just countless multitudes um, coming to know Jesus and churches being planted. Luke thinks it was significant enough to, to think about what's the process by which this happens to record all of these speeches. In other words, these speeches, the content of them, what was proclaimed had tremendous power. So spiritual events and encounters in the lives of others can sometimes be a bit difficult to understand. It, it can be like watching an unlikely couple fall in love and you think clearly something's happening here but a bit of explanation is needed. And that was the context for this speech that Peter is giving. You've had the tongues of fire falling on people's heads, you've had um, people speaking in multiple other languages and the conclusion that the crowds have drawn is, you know, these guys have been partying pretty hard and they're really drunk. And so Peter puts to bed that theory. He said, they're not drunk as some of you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. And then having given that explanation, this is not some wild party gone wrong. You know, this is nine o'clock in the morning. This is not alcohol fueled enthusiasm or, or, or craziness. This is something else. And so having given that explanation now in our passage from verse 22 onwards, Peter, in a moment of boldness and clarity, unfolds to them the story of Jesus. He says, Jesus is a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. And then he says he was put to death on a cross, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And then he talks about how that too is a fulfillment of prophecy in a psalm by King David. So Peter is saying that the resurrection power unleashed through the Son of God being uh, rising from the dead is the crux, is the crucial thing that people investigating Christianity, wondering, is this drunkenness, is this weirdness, what is causing this whole thing, that that's what they need to know. They need to know something of the resurrection. It matters that Jesus died and actually died on a cross, and it matters that he was raised from the dead. In my own family, um, I was born in Australia and and my dad was a, an academic working at the University of New South Wales. Um, he himself was not religious in any way, neither was my mum. And um, they had a really nice life. They had a lovely Australian beaches, fantastic lifestyle, and he loved his job. But in his kind of 30s, I guess, he began to ask questions about purpose and meaning in life, wondering if is, is this all there is? And um, in the process of asking some of those questions, a colleague invited him to come to a lunchtime event that was happening on the campus. 
Now, my dad had been raised as an atheist by an atheist, but he did go along to this lunchtime event. And the man was talking about the resurrection of Jesus being something that actually happened. My father just remembered one phrase from that whole lunchtime event that he heard. And that phrase was, the only reason you should be a Christian is because it's true. He just, that just struck him as unbelievably odd. He thought that's a fundamental category mistake. Christianity is about, um, it's about fantasy or it's about um, tradition or it's about superstition or it's about culture or, you know, it's about sort of um, maybe even about kind of historical ideas. But what it's not fundamentally about is truth. That really, that idea really confronted him. Then a little while after that, um, our family were at home. Um, my sister and I were, were um, born, but we were asleep. And my dad was in his study and he had an extraordinary encounter with the risen Lord Jesus. He saw his life flashing before him and a different uh, scenarios from his life playing out. And um, he saw the reaction on the face of Jesus to those instances and experience what you and I as Christians might describe as conviction of sin. He didn't have those words to describe it, but he knew that he needed the forgiveness of Jesus. And at the end of this vision, he saw Christ on the cross and he just knelt down and he said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And that's how he became a Christian. He went upstairs and woke my mum up and said, Jane, the most amazing thing has happened. I've become a Christian. And my mum was less than excited about this. She had um, gone to boarding school here in the UK and had had a very sort of boring experience of school chapel, a very effective inoculation um, against uh, true Christianity. And she wasn't interested at all. So she was rather horrified by this. And when my dad said, well, you know, I want to meet other people who are Christians, maybe we could try church. Um, She thought to herself, well, I know my husband is intelligent. I know how I might be able to cure him of Christianity. So she said, okay, I'll come to church with you, but only if it's Anglican, thinking, you know, once he's experienced that, he'll be cured for life. He'll be fine. It'll be so boring. So they showed up the next Sunday um, at their local Anglican church in Sydney and it was a a full-blown sort of evangelical, Bible-believing, Christ-worshipping church. And um, my dad absolutely loved it and my mum absolutely hated it. It took her um, another six months of, of, of questioning and really finding her own way to Christ. But for my father, that idea that Christianity is actually true, that the resurrection of Jesus is something that really genuinely occurred, was utterly confronting. And then through that encounter with the risen Lord Jesus himself, the whole trajectory of our family um, was, was changed, was impacted. In this speech of Peter, we see the man who denied Christ, The man who was too afraid to admit that he'd even been with Jesus. We see him utterly on fire with the spirit fire, proclaiming the truth of the resurrection. It really matters that Jesus actually died and that he was genuinely raised from the dead. It matters that this really happened. Now, um, you may be surprised to hear that... um, Even today, academics studying the resurrection and studying evidence for the resurrection have, um, have, I guess, concluded that it still matters. And that uh, when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus, this is not something kind of mythological or, or in the realm of fantasy. Richard Swinburne, he was the philosophy professor at the University of Oxford for many years and did a piece of research into the resurrection of Jesus, looking at the probability of the resurrection of Christ having actually occurred. And he used a probability formula known as Bayes' theorem. And um, he assigned various kind of mathematical values to different factors around the resurrection of Jesus. And then he used this mathematical theorem to come to a conclusion about whether this really happened, whether it was probable that it really happened. And taking into account 
um, the fact that obviously he'd assign those numbers to those different factors. The, the mechanism that he used, the number that he came out with at the end was 0.97. In other words, 97% is the number that he would be using to assess the probability of Christ's resurrection having actually occurred. N.T. Wright says this, he says, no other explanations have been offered in 2000 years of sneering skepticism against the Christian witness that can satisfactorily account for how the tomb came to be empty and how the disciples came to see Jesus and how their lives and worldviews were transformed. Jesus rose from the dead. Peter's unleashing as this tremendous speech giver and evangelist with all his baggage, with his denial of Jesus, with his weaknesses, with his relative disadvantages. Um, it just in terms of, of being a, an orator in the ancient world, he hadn't had that kind of classical education. He, he was a fisherman and he was brilliant at it. But here we see his stature as the preacher who effectively kicks off the global church movement. And it is founded not on his abilities. It is founded not even on his competence to be a friend of Jesus. It is not founded on his eloquence or his education. It is founded on the reality of the resurrection of the Son of God. It is founded on the fact that Jesus Christ has overcome death. And as Peter put it in his speech, death could not hold him. Now, in our time right now, at the moment, as we read daily of the numbers of people in our nation dying due to the coronavirus, perhaps we're more conscious of the power of death. Perhaps many of us are struggling with anxiety through just hearing about that so much. I have a number of friends who've been in touch and we pray for one another and quite a few of them have experienced full-blown panic attacks for the first time in their lives in this season that we're facing in Britain, this season of, of, of fear. And here we have that promise that Christ is the one that death could not hold down. And as a consequence of that resurrection of Jesus that actually happened, that really happened, Peter is filled with the Spirit's fire. A tongue of fire had lit up Peter's head. He'd spoken in tongues in, in different languages that he'd never known before, never been taught. And now he is preaching to a vast crowd with real anointing. Now, one of the things that I find encouraging here is that there's no contradiction between grasping and realising truth, being confident in that truth and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Those two things go hand in hand. Fullness of the Spirit in the book of Acts leads to others hearing about and responding to Jesus for themselves. The Spirit's fire falling on us draws people to Jesus. In my own life, I can say that um, experiences of the Holy Spirit's fire um, coming upon me have also led to, to that sort of thing happening. When I was a student um, at university in Britain, we were in a real season of the, of the Holy Spirit moving in, in different churches and people being stirred for mission and for prayer in new ways. And during that time, uh, a small group of us, just three of us as students, felt that God was calling us to go to Afghanistan. And um, the Taliban had just taken three quarters of the country and um, they were this, this regime that were uh, sort of, I guess, imposing this very extreme form of Islam on people and lots of people were being killed. And we just felt stirred to, 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 to go to that nation and, and pray and ultimately take the gospel. And the night before we left, um, I had a dream. And in that dream, I saw the three of us giving Bibles to the Taliban. And I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but we did end up in the military headquarters of the Taliban interviewing the education minister, the foreign minister and the religion minister of that movement. And we did have the opportunity to ask them lots of questions and at the end to share with them something of 
who Christ is. I wasn't actually allowed to speak. The other two members of the team were male. As a female, I was not allowed to speak in the presence of the Taliban. But the two men on our team explained that. And at the end, we got the Bibles out and we gave them to them. And we said, we, we think this is the most precious gift we could give you. It's, it's our holy book. It's, it's the Bible. And the religion minister, the keeper of the Holy Quran, took the Bible and he said, I know exactly what this book is. And I've been praying to God for years that I could read this book. Thank you for bringing it to me. I'm going to read it every day until I finish it. We were absolute nobodies, just three 19-year-old students. But the Spirit's fire had fallen on us. Two of those 19-year-old students had only become Christians really genuinely about two years earlier and been taken a hold of by God. Not being Christians for long, we were young, we had very little theological understanding. Um, we, we didn't really know what we were doing culturally, but the Spirit's fire moved so that those people could receive Bibles and hear the gospel. Peter preaches in the fire of the Spirit. And sometimes we think, well, I'm too young or I'm too old. I'm not theologically educated enough or I'm really busy with my work or I'm too poor or I'm too linguistically challenged um, to, 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 to share the gospel in another language or I'm too shy or I'm an introvert or whatever the reason is but none of these are barriers to the Holy Spirit. Peter preaches in the fire of the Spirit and he proclaims that Jesus' resurrection demonstrates something, that Jesus has been shown to be the promised Messiah, that he is king over all emperors, Jewish, Roman, Greek, that he is the one who has died for our sins, that we might be forgiven and that death could not hold on to him that he was raised from the dead. Peter says that Jesus is the Lord. That's the Jewish name for God in the Old Testament. With all the battles that we're facing and all the challenges that we feel are assaulting us at the moment, do we need to again encounter Jesus as the Lord, the one who is totally supreme over death, over evil? We need that fire of the Spirit to fall on us. And that is the promise of the scripture. We see that at the end of Peter's spe uh, speech, when the people ask, what shall we do? They see something amazing has happened and they're moved to ask, what can we do? And Peter's answer is, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the promised Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, for your children, for those who are far off and for all whom the Lord will call. The promise is for you, for your children. It's for all of us. So how might we respond? We desperately need the Holy Spirit's empowering and filling. Let's pray. Let's ask for him to come right now with his power, with his presence, with his fire even in our rooms as we're just watching this right now. Let's pray that we too might be filled with the Spirit's fire. Let's just do that right now. So Holy Spirit, where, um, wherever we are, all over the UK, together, just watching this, we invite you to come. We ask that you would fill us now with this promise. You, you've promised that it's for all who will repent and call on the name of the Lord Jesus for us, for our children, for those near and far. So will you come? Will you fill us now? Will you anoint us with that fire? And then secondly, how else might we respond? Well, may we know that renewed confidence in the resurrected Lord not as a sort of mind game where we're trying to trick ourselves into being confident because we're, we're feeling afraid and we, we, you know, we, we somehow try and stir up confidence in ourselves. Might we receive confidence from the resurrected Jesus based on, rooted in that truth that he is raised from the dead? And might we know that he has authority over death? Death could not hold him 
So life with him lasts beyond the grave. May our confidence be rooted. May we be carried by him into that new godly confidence so that when anxiety swirls, we can be grounded supernaturally on that truth. And might we meditate day by day on that truth that Jesus is the resurrected Lord, that death could not hold him so we can trust him even as death swirls around us. And then just lastly, as the gospel is proclaimed, do we believe right now that it's just too hard and we're too ordinary so we we, we can't be ones who proclaim the gospel? Let's invite the Spirit to anoint us to do that, to take the gospel out. So Father, we commit ourselves to you. We pray for that confidence in the name of Jesus, that confidence in you as the resurrected Lord to be rooting us in who you are. And we pray that you might use us to take the gospel to the world. In the name of Jesus, amen. So we're gonna sing um, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Let's sing, Our Father. Our Father in heaven the 
So I wanted to share a new song. And this is a song of faith. In John 16, Jesus says, in this life, we will face trials and troubles, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And because of the blood of Jesus, because of what he did for us on the cross, he has made us to overcome as well. He has called us a people of faith. Faith being the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. So this is a song to sing over your circumstance. When the darkness comes rushing in, I will set my face like flint. Firmly rooted in You help me to sing over my sorrows And you help me to dance over my troubles And you help me to laugh in the face of my trials So wings like eagles I rise Cause you have overcome, yes you have overcome And you made me an overcomer too And you made me an overcomer too When the darkness comes rushing in I will set my face like flint Firmly rooted in unending love I know that I will win Cause you help me Cause you help me to sing over my sorrows And you help me So on wings like eagles I'll rise Cause you have overcome Cause you have overcome Yes, you have overcome And you made me an overcomer too You have overcome Yes, you have overcome And you made me an overcomer too So even in my disappointment I will pray you, I will praise you. Even in my hopeless places, I will give thanks. I will give thanks. Even in my disappointment, I will praise you. I will praise you. Even in my hopeless places, I will give thanks. I will And you made me an overcomer too You have overcome, yes you have overcome And you made me an overcomer too Come and sing it over yourself today You have overcome, yes you have overcome And you made me an overcomer too That's why even in my disappointment, I will praise you, I will praise you. And even in my hopeless places, I will give thanks, I will give thanks. Jesus Christ 
is Lord. Let's sing it out today. He is Lord. There is no other. He is Lord. Lord, your love is the anchor and our hope is in you alone. Amen. It's been uh, great to see so many of you praying for each other in the chat and, um, and I encourage that to continue. You might know each other, you might not know each other, but we can continue to pray for each other. And just during this evening, as Amy was speaking and as we've been worshipping, a few of our planning group have been listening to God for you and there's been a real sense that some of you might feel a real uh, a desperation or a longing for that encounter, encounter with God, an encounter with Jesus, an encounter with the Holy Spirit, to really uh, sense his presence and know him better. And um, perhaps like Amy's dad in the story that she told. And, and we believe that's possible. We believe that that can happen. And perhaps what it means for you this week is to find some space and some time in your home to sit and wait, to wait on God and say, I want to meet with you. I want to encounter with you. Please let heaven come, as we sang after Amy spoke. Let heaven come to me in this moment. We can ask God for that and we can wait for him. The Bible is full of promises that God comes when we wait for him. And that waiting 
might look different for all of us, but uh, I really encourage you to spend that time this week looking for that space and asking to encounter God. And, and perhaps for some of you, it might have been the desire to speak in tongues for the first time or again for the first time in a long time. And, and you can ask, for God that, ask God for that too and say, please, Lord, I want to praise you in a heavenly language, in another language. And, um, and we believe that God will answer those cries and those prayers. So I really encourage you to find that time and that space. Uh, and I pray, I pray right now, Heavenly Father, that you would come encounter your children where they want to encounter you. We thank you for that promise in the book of James that when we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. Draw near, we pray, to each one of us. Amen. And I encourage you too to share your testimonies. If God has been working and moving in you, then let us know so that we can all share and rejoice in it and thank God for what he's doing. Also, for those of you who might be uh, feeling uh, a struggle at the moment or need help and you're not quite sure where to reach out from, there is a number that you can call. There's an amazing organisation sprung up in the midst of the coronavirus uh, pandemic called yourneighbour.org and they have a helpline that is manned. There are people at the end of the phone uh, seven days a week from nine till five and that number is going to come up on the screen. I'm going to tell it to you. It is 0300. 323-9952. It's also in the description about this film and you can call that number if you need help. And also if you go to yourneighbour.org, you can see lots of ways that the church can get involved in being the answer to those prayers and in answering uh, the call and the needs of our local communities. So I encourage you to look into that. So just a couple of reminders before we close, don't forget to look into the work of Mercy Ships. They are struggling too in the pandemic with many of the medics on their ship, ship being called back to their jobs at home um, to, to fight the virus wherever they are from. And so Mercy Ships need our prayers at the moment. And as well, if you feel called to go and volunteer, then uh, check out their website, mercyships.org.uk and, uh, and also to give to their work. And of course, to the work of Spring Harvest. If you are able and you can afford to and you feel led to, please do give to support us at this time of uncertainty so that we can commit to 2021. Wow, what an evening, wasn't it? Brilliant to hear the, the word of God, the Bible preached so passionately and so powerfully this evening. I hope that you've enjoyed it. And we've got more to come in the rest of the evening and the rest of our lives. We've got comedy starting at nine o'clock uh, or as close to as we can. We've got Paul Carenza, an amazing comedian, will be live from his home and interacting with you then. There's also Night Blessings at 10 p.m. with Malcolm Duncan and Jonathan Vera singing us to sleep so beautifully as he does. Uh, those are all to look forward to here on our YouTube channel. And I'm also gonna leave you with an amazing video that has just uh, been made very recently by an amazing team, Will and Mim Johnson. They're from St. Thomas Church up in Newcastle and they made this video uh, and written this song, especially about the church being unleashed. And uh, if you want to see it again after this evening, there's a link again in this, um, the description of this film underneath and you can see the song again. But it's filmed uh, with all the members of St. Thomas in Newcastle, if you're watching, hello. And, uh, and it really shows us what it is to be this church that uh, however, we are and wherever we are the spirit empowers us to look after each other so i'm going to leave you with this song so that you can skip out go and get a cup of tea and a biscuit and some chocolate and whatever else you fancy and come back at nine for some comedy and uh, we'll see you again tomorrow good night